I'm Josh. Um, a few years ago, I started a company um, with a co-founder um, called Card.io. Um, I was subsequently acquired by uh, Braintree and PayPal. Um, and I thought I'd sort of tell you how it works, because it was an interesting project. It was one of the earliest mobile computer vision projects. But before I tell you how it works, I should tell you what it is, um, in case you haven't encountered it. So the idea is you're going to go buy something with your, uh, your mobile device, and you get to this point where you have to type in your credit card number, and that sucks. Um, and I thought, well, you know, it would be so much nicer if you could just, you have this camera here, you just hold your credit card up in front of the camera, and then we can find the card and read the digits off of it and fill them in for you, um, and then you can continue on and you don't have to type. Um, and so that was what Card.io did, um, that was what we made, and um, it actually started, um, we, we weren't going to start that company. We were going to start a, like an Android payments company, and, and I was developing it, and I um, spent a week testing out different UIs, and I spent basically all day every day typing credit card numbers into my phone, and I was like, fuck this. <laughs> we are not going to do this company. We're going to do something way more fun. Um, and uh, what made it possible, really, was the fact that it's a, it's a very narrow, very specific project. Um, computer vision is hard, um, and we were very focused. Um, and much to our surprise and delight, um, it got really popular. So it's now used by PayPal and Uber and a bunch of other companies. I think Twitter's in the process of integrating it. Um, and courtesy of PayPal and Braintree, um, as of a couple months ago, it's open source. Um, so go ahead, paw through the code, um, find our bugs, that would be awesome. Um, however, it wasn't really started being an open source project in mind, and so the documentation is like that. So <laughs> that's why I'm here talking to you. Um, this is round one of documentation. Okay, so before I tell you how it works, um, we should get acquainted with what some of the actual There, now I can move, that's better. Um, some of the challenges are um, when working on mobile computer vision. First of all, um, you have really crappy cameras. Um, new iPhones, like the really new ones, have nice cameras, but back when we started a few years ago, like the iPhone 4 was where it was at, and they, um, they focus slowly, um, they have low quality pictures, there's distortion, um, there's a bunch of things that are in the way, and even now, low end Android devices still have really bad cameras. So we're gonna be working with bad input, by the cameras. Um, they have really slow processors. Um, and again, we still support low-end Android devices. And actually, even if you have a fast processor, you have a new iPhone, um, I don't want to drain your battery life. So I'm going to design for low processor usage. Um, uh, this is going to be used under real-world conditions. So Google Books uses OCR, but they have a like setup, and they set their book down, and they have this like perfect camera and a green screen. Whereas on mobile, like you know, there's some dude and he's like trying to buy like diapers, and he's sitting at a bus stop, and the bus is coming, and he's like, "Come on!" Um, so every every sort of real-world scenario we have to handle, and um, that also means that it's being used by humans, and humans will do all sorts of crazy and bizarre things um, given the opportunity. Uh, and of course, we have to support multiple platforms, so iOS, Android, and importantly, we also have a sort of development platform where you can run all the code on your desktop without having to copy it to your phone multiple times. Um, and that actually is not open source yet. We're working on it. Okay, so enough preamble. <laughs> uh, but this is what I was like when I started, by the way. I had no computer vision, no machine learning background when I started this project. Um, so we're all in the same place. Okay, the overall idea um, is we're going to use a processing pipeline. And this is a very common approach uh, for computer vision projects and machine learning projects. Um, so some nice things about a pipeline um, is your flow is really easy. You're going to get into the beginning of the pipeline, you're going to get some frame that comes out of the camera. That's your very first input. The first stage is going to do some processing and spit out something. The second stage is going to do some processing and spit out something. And it'll work its way through the pipeline. And if everything goes well, at the end, you have the data you want. The nice thing is, if something goes wrong early on, you can bail, um, and if you want to develop it and you're like, man, this stage is really bad, you can independently swap out a better implementation without having to mess with the rest of it. So processing pipelines are very common for this side, sort of work, um, and every stage has to be pretty robust. That is, it has to be prepared <coughs> to handle really bad quality input. And the reason is, um, we're working with real world conditions and computer vision is bloody hard. So, um, you know, you're going to put a bunch of effort into one stage and it's still going to suck. And your next stage has to be prepared to deal with the, the shitty output from your previous stage. The good news about this is it makes for really robust systems. There's no single points of failure because every, every stage is ready to clean up the mess of the previous stage. Um, 
One other note about the pipeline, um, and you'll hear this as I talk a little more, um, we want to bail as soon as we know that something is not going our way. Um, and the reason is, the camera is feeding us frames at 30 or 60 per second. So <coughs> if things haven't gone well, in 15 or 30 milliseconds, we're going to have a new frame. So maybe the future will be better. Um, let's just cut our losses and get another frame right away. Um, it's a really good strategy if you have access to that kind of data. Okay, so um, here's the actual high-level pipeline. Um, we have to get a usable frame. Like, you know, if the user has their thumb over the camera, we're not going anywhere. Um, once we have something that we can even do any processing on, um, we're going to try to find the card in the frame. There must be a credit card in there somewhere, right? Once you have the credit card, we're going to try to find the numbers on the credit card. And then once we've found them, we've drawn little bounding boxes around every single credit card number. We're going to try to interpret that set of pixels as a number. Is it a 2? Is it a 7? Etc. And then um, once we've done that, we're going to wait for another frame and we're going to aggregate. And this aggregation is crucial. You'll see this over and over again. Um, if you've taken a machine learning course, you'll hear um, somebody say repeatedly um, that data trumps algorithms. Um, this is absolutely true. If you can, s you can spend months building fancier algorithms using better math, et cetera, or you can triple the amount of data you put in the system, you're going to get way better results with the extra data. The same thing is true with these online systems like this. Um, if we just feed more frames through and aggregate the results of multiple frames, we get better results than trying really hard on this one frame. So um, in general, Card.io goes for being slightly sloppy and fast so that um, we can take advantage of averaging over multiple frames and use more data. Um, it also removes single points of failure. If one run through the pipeline goes badly, you know, 15 milliseconds later, we get to try it again. Um, and uh, doing less work on each run makes the UX really, really responsive, which is important, and helps keep binary size down, which is also a challenge for mobile apps. All right, so um, enough talk. The first part is we need to get a usable frame. So what can go wrong? <laughs> well, it might be too dark. Um, it might be uh, have motion blur. So maybe the user is like doing this with their credit card, or maybe they're doing this with their phone, or both, or, or there's an earthquake. Um, <laughs> we have problems. Um, and then it might also be out of focus. A lot of camera phones have a hard time focusing well, um, and the user might be sort of doing this with their card. Um, and uh, if one of those things is going on, there's really not much we can do, um, and we just want to very cheaply identify that we, we, this is a non-starter, and we want to try and get another frame. And um, we didn't pay a lot of attention to this at the very beginning, and one of our um, first customers was a hotel app, and um, it turned out that all of their users were drunk <laughs> and at bars and wanted to get a hotel. <coughs> I don't know why. Um, <laughs> anyway, so this meant that like all of our users are trying to use this computer vision app and it's dark in the bar, and they're doing this with both the phone and the card. And we're like, oh man, um, okay, we really need to pay attention to, uh, to this very first stage. So um, we know what's wrong, right? It's too damn dark. But um, how do we tell our drunk user, it's too dark, light a candle, or go to the bathroom or do something? <laughs> um, so we tried a bunch of different UIs. Um, like the very first one, you know, this is a standard um, engineering solution, right? Oh, yeah, just, just pop up an alert and be like, it's too dark. Um, users hate that. Okay, um, so no alerts. Um, I know, let's put a little like um, flashing light icon up at the top right. And so when it's too dark, we like turn on the light bulb. Um, and uh, we tried that with users and users are like, what's that thing? It's really annoying. Can I turn it off? Can I get rid of it? Um, and finally we realized um, even drunk users like, they have brains, they can think. <laughs> and it takes them about two seconds to be like, I'm gonna type this in, oh, I can't see the card. Huh, I wonder if that's what's wrong. <laughs> like, they make that inference. Um, and humans actually really like to think and they like to learn, um, and they will learn your, your UI um, if you don't make it suck. And a lot of people make UIs that suck. Um, and the number one way to make a UI usable is to have it be very responsive. When you do something, immediately you get feedback. Is it going well or isn't it? And that means that the, 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 um, the, the learning feedback cycle is really fast. So it was really critical to us throughout this whole experience that everything would be really fast. So you know, within 15, 30 milliseconds, when the user moves the card a little bit, they know whether it's working. Uh, there is one exception to users being able to think, and that's venture capitalists. 
Um, so when we were, when we were um, showing Card.io to all these VCs to try to get funding, they did the most amazing things. This one VC was like, he took the credit card, he slapped it right on top of the phone, he's like, it's not working. <laughs> and another one was like, where do the dollar bills come out? And I'm like, man, if I can make my phone shit dollar bills, I don't need to talk to you. <laughs> But that's okay, VCs are not our target audience. <laughs> All right, so suppose we've got a good, um, clean, usable frame. This is a beautiful frame here. Um, now we want to actually start doing some processing, and I said the first thing we're going to do is we're going to try to find the card in the frame. So um, stage one is to find edges, and edges can be like curvy, you know, like around the edge of my hand here. Um, and we're going to use a very standard computer vision technique for this called the canny edge detector. Um, it's like week two of computer vision. And I'll step you through how it goes, because it's sort of neat. Um, edges are places where things go from dark to light or light to dark. So to find edges, we're going to um, start by taking a derivative in the x direction. And the derivative is just you know, looking for significant changes from light to dark or dark to light. Those will be significant derivatives. And we're going to do it in the y direction, too. And then we're going to take those and we're going to combine them into an overall for any pixel, like how much is it changing here? We're going to throw away the ones that don't change much. And then we're going to try to stitch together a clean edge out of that. So we can make this nice and concrete. Um, we've got a little live demo here. Hi, I'm famous. <laughs> OK, so here we are. Um, here's the x derivative. And you can see here that these vertical lines behind me show up significantly as x derivatives. Here's the y derivative. Those vertical lines are very interesting. My glasses totally are x, y. And you can see that if you combine them, this is the overall magnitude, um, you can see that you sort of have bright spots in places where there's some sort of edge going on. And then wave your hands and we stitch it together and we get something like this. So the ease of the edges. This is a, a live um, feed of a canny edge detector running on me. And you can see it working on a credit card. Um, by the way, if any of you are like trying to write down the credit card numbers, these are expired gift cards. <laughs> so, <laughs> um, so you can see this is sort of promising. You know, it's like found some edges of the credit card. Awesome. All right, so step one, great success. Um, by the way, a word, on, uh, a word on why we use Canny. There are fancier techniques out there, and they're like new and modern and shiny, and Canny is like from the 1980s. Using an old technique is awesome. First of all, um, it was developed at a time where computers were even slower than our phones are. So I already know that it's not going to be too slow to run. And second, um, it's kind of simple. And simple is good. Simple means I can go in there and hack on the code and um, futz with it and make it work for our conditions. Um, and actually throughout, you'll see um, everything we did in Cardio was really simple. And the thing that made it work was being able to go in and, and hack on the code and solve the sort of real world problems that we actually encountered. OK. so. Great. We found edges, um, but they're curvy and stuff. Um, and we're trying to find the card. So what we want to do now is find straight lines. Like the distinctive feature of the card is that it's got all these like straight edges around it. And uh, for that, we're going to use um, the Huff detector. Oh yeah, oh, that's why I have slides. <laughs> um, so this is our only feedback to the user during the whole card I/O experience: is um, have we found the top edge of your card? Have we found the left edge? Have we found the bottom edge? Um, and you can actually see. If I zoom backwards, you can see what that looks like in the UI. It starts with these little brackets, and as it finds one edge at a time, it fills in those lines. Um, and filling in lines is really satisfying. You're like, ah, oh, look, I completed the line. Um, I screwed this up when I started. I did, again, the standard engineering thing, and I was like, I'll make the box red, and then when I find the line, it'll turn green. And users are like, why is there a flashing Christmas tree? <laughs> and, and the colorblind users are like, why is there a box? <laughs> Don't do that. <laughs> um, OK, so anyway, the good thing about this is it's pretty early on in the pipeline. It provides very fast feedback, and users get it really quickly. They're like, oh, I see. You found that top edge. I'm doing something right. And um, users really do need to learn to use this. Like, I watch people, and the first second, they're like, I am so confused. And then like half a second, they're like, oh, I got it. And this is fun. Um, so th the training is important. OK, so how do we find straight lines? Um, we use the Huff transform. Another very old, very standard, very boring technique. Um, but I want to tell you how it works because it's a really cool idea. And the core idea is sort of is applicable. There'll be some point 10 years from now where you're like, I know that thing. If only I could remember 
what it was called. That guy talked about it 10 years ago. That's exactly what I need. Okay, so it uses an accumulator space. Um, I stole this image from Wikipedia, so if you go Google this later, you'll see it again. Um, what's on the left here is an input image. Um, and hopefully, our Huff transform is gonna find two straight lines in this input image. And what's on the right um, is the space of all possible lines. And it's a 2D space. The vertical axis is how far from the center it is, so it's sort of like the offset. You know, I've got a line at this particular angle, but where is it? The x-axis is the angle. So I've got a line right here, and now I can twist it back and forth. And you can see that if you move over this 2D space, you can sort of cover all of the lines that are out there. Now what we're gonna do is we're gonna go pixel by pixel through our input image, and if, if the pixel's not set, we're just gonna ignore it, because it's not a part of any line, we don't really care. But when we find a pixel that's set, we're like, okay, this pixel, this pixel is a part of all these possible lines, right? This pixel right here is a part of this line, and this line, and this line, and this line, and this line. And we're gonna go through our accumulator space, and we're gonna add one to every single line that this pixel is a part of. And we're gonna keep going. And when we hit this next second, the second set pixel, we're gonna do it again. And for the most part, you know, this line here and this line here, they're not the same line, so they don't overlap. So there's a whole bunch of ones. There's one spot that there's a two in this accumulator space. It's this line right here that they're both a part of. And you can see as this happens over and over again, you're gonna find these spots in the accumulator space where multiple pixels are contributing to the same line, and they end up sort of bright, like those two spots there. So once you've gone through and you've transformed every pixel in your input that's set to a bunch of lines in your accumulator space, you go through your accumulator space, you find the brightest spots, and those correspond to the lines in the input. I hope I didn't lose everybody. We're gonna do it again later. Okay. So let's see what this looks like. All right, I'm famous again. Um, boom. They're in blue. Oh, shit. <laughs> They're kind of in blue. You can sort of see the blue overlay here. These are some straight lines that I found. Um, okay. This worked way better in my hotel room, I promise. Okay, so this was our input image here. Um, you can see that we ran it through a canny edge detector. Um, and uh, I drew on in red the little bounding boxes where we're searching for the lines, and in green you can see the lines that it actually found that compose the edge of the card. So, so far so good. Here it is superimposed on the original image, so you can see that it really actually did its job. And um, at that point, we're kind of off to the races. Um, we found the card. Um, but of course it's sort of at a skewy, funny angle, um, because no user sober or drunk can hold their card and their phone in perfect alignment. Um, so it's gonna be a little wobbly. And we wanna do our best to clean it up for the next stage because it'll make life easier. So what we're gonna do is um, we're gonna try to transform it to be just a nice, clean rectangle for us. Um, and fortunately, there are ISO standards about credit cards, so they're all exactly the same shape. So we know what our target is. So if we find some screwy card, we can make it exactly the right target. And the, it's pretty easy. You have these lines, you do a bit of math, you find some intersections, you generate a 3D transform it, um, you give it to the GPU. Um, and it's not what we're talking about, it's, it's very straightforward. Um, but you can see, here we found the intersections. So we, now the, we know the area we want to transform. And here we've transformed it. Um, well, mostly. If you look closely, you see in the top left there that we sort of screwed up a little bit. We didn't quite get the edge of the card right. But that's okay. Um, every stage of the pipeline is prepared to have um, sort of chip fed to it. So <laughs> it's close enough. It's fine. <laughs> if it wasn't fine, we'd have bigger problems. Okay, <laughs> easy, right? That was like, you know, week two of computer vision, you guys are all set to build the first half of card IO. Well, um, not quite. So if you just do that, you end up with a mediocre system that doesn't really work very well. We needed it to be fast and responsive for users and we need it to be robust so that, you know, when you're um, drunk and, and trying to like do it against your genes while somebody <laughs> holds a candle, um, it actually responds well. So here's a few of the little tricks, um, and there are a bunch of them, a few of the little tricks that we went in and hacked into the code. Um, so multiple color planes. Let's see, back to grayscale. All right, so I, bought a, I brought a green card here, and I have a nice pink hand, and if you put them next to each other, 
they're kind of the same amount of grayscale. Um, and in fact, I think if we run the canny here, that edge, depending on how lucky we are, totally sort of disappears. It's not very reliable um, because it's the same brightness. But we get color from the camera, so we should use it. Here's, the, uh, here's a blue delta plane. Not much interest there, but here's a red delta plane. Holy cow, Batman, there's the card. <laughs> Um, so we start with the grayscale, and that's great, but you know, we fall back so that pink people can read green cards. Um, okay, so there's one. Um, another, uh, oh yeah, I can stay here. All right. So here's our X derivative again. Um, this is nice and sharp. Um, it's also really expensive to compute. Um, so for those of you guys, if you don't know what convolutions are, don't worry about it, but you compute the X derivative um, by convolving with a kernel. And if you use a big kernel, like seven by seven, you get a nice sharp image, and if you use a small kernel, like three by three, um, you get a much less bright and contrasty image. And the difference is basically compute power. And um, so we were like, man, that seven by seven kernel, this one that gives you the nice crisp um, image, <clears throat> that's what we want, but um, it takes like 95% of the processing time on phones. And so we tried to drop it down to three by three or five by five, and it just fell on its face. Like you just couldn't find cards anymore. And so we realized that, um, I realized that I was gonna have to dig in and I spent a month um, learning about the vector coprocessor on phones and assembly, and I rewrote the core of um, this computer vision piece from OpenCV, which is already pretty heavily optimized. I made it three times faster and um, we could use this um, better edge detection. And so again, we used the off the shelf stuff, but we found the spot by profiling where it really mattered and we went and attacked it. Okay, um, adaptive thresholds. So here's our, here's our canny edge detector. Um, there are these magic numbers in the canny edge detector and you can see it's like it finds some edges but not a lot. If we change these magic numbers, holy cow, we can find a lot of lines. Um, that's too many, that's too few. Um, and by the way, too many and too few depends on context. If you are in a dark place or a light place, what kind of backgrounds you have. And so if you just put in some numbers, which is what everyone does in the canny um, thing, it falls on its face in the real world. So we built a pretty ad hoc system to analyze the scene and um, adjust the thresholds for the canny to always get good, uh, good things out of it. And lastly, um, these huff lines you can see here, they're at a slight angle. And if you're holding your credit card like this, um, I can't help you. <laughs> but I don't wanna waste a bunch of processing resources finding um, lines at an angle that I'm just gonna be like So I really wanted to restrict the angle of the lines. Again, a lot of card IO was about getting the performance we needed. And so um, I'm now gonna disagree with Scott. I don't know how many people were here for Scott's talk yesterday, but. He was like, you know, you gotta contribute back. This is what open source is about, is about, you know, fixing bugs and upstreaming things. And sorry, Scott, um, I didn't upstream stuff and it was totally the right decision. And I'm gonna rant about it for a minute because we've all been told to upstream everything and to never repeat yourself and don't copy and paste code. Well, there is a time and a place. So <laughs> here's what would have happened um, if I tried to upstream my angle restriction. I'd be like, okay, um, there's this huff lines call and it needs another parameter. And there's different ways to set up the parameters, so I have to think really carefully about what it is, and then I have to document it. And the OpenCV developers have to vet my code and think about the API, and every user from here on out that is gonna use the API is gonna have to think about this parameter and decide whether they wanna use it and understand it, so it's gonna make it harder for them to use. And every developer that ever goes to work on OpenCV codebase is gonna have to make sure they don't break my shit when they fix other bugs. And the thing is, most people want all kinds of lines. Like, it's just me that wants the world to be like, you know, nice and rectangular. The right answer for everybody is what I did, which is copy, paste, edit, commit, done. Um, I'm here to tell you, it is okay. Um, like everything in the engineering world, it's a question of judgment. Make a judgment call. Is this peculiar to my scenario and should I just do it? And even, even screw open source. Like I have a function 15 files over. I can add another parameter to that function or it's like five lines long, I'll just copy and paste it here and change it. It's okay. <laughs> Use your brain. Um, okay, done with rant. Um, so that was the easy part actually. So now we found the credit card. Um, now we're on to the next part. Next part is 
where the hell are the numbers? Um, so we're going to do this in two parts. First, we're going to find where they are vertically, and then we're going to find where they are horizontally. <coughs> so vertically, we want to go from this nice, almost perfectly cropped credit card to just this little strip here. The rest of it, we don't really care about. Um, actually, we kind of care about the expiry, but we really don't care about it. We just want these bits right here. So how are we going to find them? We're going to resort to machine learning because it's too hard. Um, so here's what the actual process looks like. We're going to do some pre-processing on our card image. Um, in particular, we're going to do something like these derivatives I talked about earlier where um, how much variation in brightness is um, what we're going to be interested in. And then we're going to look at single pixel strips one at a time, and we're going to feed them into a neural network. And the neural network is going to be like, yeah, this single pixel strip, that totally intersects 15 numbers, like an Amex card. Or it intersects 16, like a Visa or a MasterCard, or there ain't nothing there. That's the whole, the neural network just says, you know, 15, 16, or nothing there. And uh, we're going to do this pixel by pixel by pixel, and, you know, it's okay if it screws up some because we're going to aggregate. We're going to look for an area where it mostly agrees. Like in this area, it's like, yeah, 16, 16, nothing, 15, 16, 16. Um, and we can just take advantage of this aggregation, this averaging, to do a pretty bad model and still mostly narrow in on the right spot. Even that's too expensive, though. So um, what we actually do is we do a sample and refine. So instead of going pixel by pixel, we like go every fifth pixel. And then we look for areas that look sort of promising. So we've now just done one fifth of the work. And then we find a promising area, we zoom in, and we actually do the work every pixel just in that area. Stupid performance trick makes a big difference. Um, this is the moment, by the way, where we handle upside down cards because an astonishing number of people hold their card upside down in front of the camera. <laughs> or maybe it's the phone upside down. <laughs> I have yet to figure out what's going on. Um, but it's no problem. We can fix that for you. If the card numbers are up here instead of down there, um, you probably have it upside down, and we just flip it and keep on going. Um, so why do, we, why do we use a neural net? It's kind of easy to describe in words what an edge is. It's kind of easy to describe what a line is. It's really hard to describe like, what a number is. It has, like, it's embossed, it's shiny, it has like, shadows, there's sevens and eights. Way, way easier to just say, hey, here's a bunch of data. Um, you, neural network, you figure it out. S speaking of which, um, maybe the single biggest non-technical challenge was getting data. I don't know about you, but I have like two or three credit cards in my wallet. And I was like, I need more credit cards. So we asked our friends and we asked our family and they're like, uh -huh, I thought you weren't gonna raise funds from us. I'm like, no, no, we're not. I just need your credit cards. <laughs> <laughs> and by this time we'd raised venture capital and so I went to the VCs and I was like, we need your credit cards. And they're like, okay. And I was like, don't worry, it's just for plan B. If the company fails, we're going to Mexico. Um, <laughs> we even actually got credit cards off the internet. If someone on the internet asks you for your credit card, don't give it to them. <laughs> the odds that it's me are really small. Um, you can actually buy credit card numbers off the internet, but just not actual credit cards. Um, I, I, I checked the black markets. They, they don't have them. <laughs> um, but, you know, by hook or by crook, this is my, my stash at home. I have, I have a couple hundred credit cards. And uh, even that wasn't really enough, so we had to figure out how to, how to make our credit cards stretch as far as we could in terms of data. So I built a rig, um, which is a bunch of books, and then my phone. And I put the credit card underneath it, and I wrote a little app that continuously streamed whatever um, photos it was taking to my computer. And then I took um, lamps, any kind of light source I could find, maybe a very bright source, a diffuse source, and I would wave the lamp over top of it all over to try to simulate different lighting conditions. And I did this in a shared workspace. And like once a week, everyone else was like, what the fuck is that guy doing? <laughs> Again? <laughs> what is the problem? Uh, I know we kept the homeless people off the street. Um, anyway, so we, we finally managed to get lots and lots of data um, to, to train these models, but it was, it was a long and slow process. Um, okay, so great. We found this little strip. Now we want to pick them out horizontally. Um, and you can see, unsurprisingly, we sort of did a bad job with that four. We missed the, the piece, but that's okay. It's cool. We, you know, the next stage is going to clean up after it. So how are we going to find this, uh, where these numbers are horizontally? This is actually the single most puzzling thing I agonized over. Um, this was, you know, like two years in development, and um, this was the thing that stumped me forever. Okay, general strategy. 
and it's really simple. It took me forever to figure out, and now it's dead stupid, and I, I feel embarrassing telling you how long it, <laughs> how long it took me to find it. Um, we're going to pre-process the same way we did with the vertical segmentation. So we're you know interested in basically how much variation in brightness there is at any given pixel. And remember, we've got just like this little strip here. We're going to flatten the strip. We're going to flatten the strip by summing. And so we end up with this sort of vector of values. And each value, if it's high, there's a lot of variation in brightness above it. And if it's low, there's not much variation in brightness above it. It's sort of like how interesting is this single tiny vertical slice. Turns out, um, credit card numbers look like this in terms of um, interest. Around the edges, it's the space between the numbers since there's not much going on. And then there's a lot in the middle. And um, so we actually can pretty clearly characterize um, whether this spot here probably has a credit card number in it. Um, but we can't find all of them this way. It's pretty rough. It's pretty inaccurate. What we need is some way to sort of get a big picture of what's going on. And fortunately, credit card have this, they have this like fixed distance between every single number. And so what we have is a 2D search space. Um, uh, this should sound familiar if you were awake about 10 minutes ago, um, which I know some of you weren't. <laughs> I see you sleeping. <laughs> um, so one of the dimensions of the search space is the offset. How far is it into the very first number? And this does vary, like we might miscrop the card and the whole numbers might shift over a little bit. And then the second is, once we've found the first number, how many pixels is it step by step to get through each number? And again, this might vary because we might have miscropped and stretched the card out or squished it in. But we have this 2D search space, and um, what we can do is we can take every single sort of score, how similar it is to this bell curve, and we can say, well, this good score correlates to all of these possible combinations of offsets and widths, <coughs> So we can put them all in an accumulator space, find the promising spots, and get back out of that a good horizontal segmentation. And similarly to um, our vertical segmentation, we actually do a sampling and refining for performance reasons. Um, this is the worst stage of the pipeline, mostly because it's really hard to aggregate. Everything else we can do a bunch of averaging, this we can't really. Even the Huff transform, it's really doing a bunch of aggregating and averaging because you notice that those, those lines that it found, they weren't really filled in every pixel. They were sort of like all wobbly and stuff, but you could sort of average over most of the pixels to compensate. Okay, so great. We have these bounding boxes. We found our, our digits that we're interested in, um, and now we gotta know, like, is that a seven, is that a two? Um, these here, these are all eights from the same physical card under different lighting conditions. So this should give you an idea of what we're up against. And um, pre-processing helps, kind of. Um, they kind of look the same now, and they also kind of look like total gibberish. <laughs> um, nevertheless, we do the pre-processing, and we work with that to try to figure out what the number is. So as you can imagine, again, we're going to reach for a machine learning model um, to help us with this sort of wide variety of inputs. And a, a regular neural network is not going to be enough, because this has got to be really damn good. And the reason is, suppose you have like, you know, you get it 90% right, you gotta get every credit card number right to read the whole thing, which means if you have a 90% accuracy on each digit, you end up with 18% accuracy for the whole card. At 99% accuracy, you still end up with like 85% for the whole card. It's not very impressive. So we need a model that is gonna nail these. And I don't know about you, I'm not sure that I could get 99% of these right. I mean, I, I told you they're all eights, so that's cheating, but some of those definitely look like fives and threes to me. So we use a, a much fancier um, kind of model called a convolutional neural net, and I don't think I have time to tell you about it, but on the last <laughs> slide, there's a bunch of places where you can go look up stuff. So if you're curious, um, you can go find out about it later. And um, surprise, uh, doing this with one model, it's too slow, and it's not robust enough. So we use the same old trick, which is aggregate across uh, do some averaging across multiple models. So we actually build less accurate models, multiple of them, and then we have them sort of vote on what the number is. And this is smaller binary size, faster to run, and more robust, um, and better accuracy. Okay, and then in theory at this point, things are going swimmingly. We have um, a theory about like what all 16 digits are, and then we do some sanity checks. Credit cards have a checksum. We make sure the checksum is right. If you have a 16-digit card and it starts with an eight, 
Like there are no credit cards to start with eight. You definitely screwed something up. So if your sanity check fails, you know, you go wait another 15 milliseconds, get another frame, start again. Um, this is actually really important um, because what this enables you to do is to make all of the rest of your passes sort of fast and loose um, and make them more aggressive at guessing. And then you can filter out most of the shit at this stage. Um, and again, since we get frames so quickly, you're actually better off playing fast and loose and getting a lot of data in um, and then filtering out the junk here. And then um, this should be no surprise since I told you at the very beginning, we aggregate, wait for another frame, combine the results, <coughs> wait for it to stabilize. Um, we do a bit of exponential decay so that if you just like hang out there for an hour with your thumb over one of the digits and then you take away your thumb, we can respond pretty quickly. Um, and then beyond that, like there's nothing fancy. I think the, the heuristics are like, we must have at least three, three, three um, frames and they have to mostly agree. Like the, the amount of um, logic here is like a couple if statements. Um, but again, it makes a big difference um, for the overall accuracy. So in theory, we end up with something like this and everybody is happy. Um, the user gets to like show their date, the cool thing they have on their phone. Um, and I get my company acquired. And uh, <laughs> so we're done with the, with the tour of Card IO. Um, let me run through, through a few, um, few lessons that I learned while building it. Um, investing in your tools pays off. So uh, I spent weeks building crazy displays for myself so I could take you know, a directory of like 5,000 card images and I could page through one by one and I could see you know, the X and Y derivatives and the canny and the huff and the, the vertical transform and the horizontal and all of the pieces all there all in one screen and I could start to build an intuition about what was working and what wasn't working. Um, and everyone made fun of me because I <coughs> had this like, you know, like NASA style display, um, but it made me so much more effective at, at understanding the real problem. Um, similarly, I had all this data and I didn't know what machine learning model was gonna work. Um, so I stored the data in this incredibly simple format and then I built tools um, as fast as I needed to, um, to export that same data into the format that libsvm wanted or that scikit wanted. So I could, you know, over the course of a week, I could try out like basically all the machine learning um, stuff that was on the internet um, really quickly and find out what was gonna work. So um, this also, by the way, this applies not just to building yourself good tools, but <coughs> investing in knowing the tools that are standard. So if you're one of these people that um, like kind of hates Git and you know like five commands and when something breaks, you ask your friend how to fix it, like don't be that person. Take a day, take two days, Learn about Git, learn the object model. It's really elegant, really clever. Um, that's a terrible UI, learn the UI. Um, figure out um, how to make Git for you. Learn your, you know, your Vim or your Emacs shortcuts if you're one of those crazy people. Um, time spent invested in your tools repays itself a um, hundredfold. That's a, that's a technical number, that hundredfold. Um, so in general, um, run towards your solution as fast as possible. Take every single shortcut do this, do, you know, do like cheat at every stage. And then there's gonna be some moment where you can't cheat anymore. This for us was the, um, the, the convolution kernels of a certain size. And then take the time where you really say, you know what, this one, this one needs time and give yourself the time to really go deep on it and um, really uh, attack the problem. And in the end, that's what makes the difference between an amazing product and a sort of good product is that after getting to good, you went and found the pieces and really invested in getting the polish in. Um, so if, if I, when we were being um, acquired, um, the various companies that were trying to acquire us, and I, I think I'm still under NDA for, for who they were, they kept being like, so can you, do, um, can you do gift cards? Can you do driver's licenses? Can you do passports? Can you do checks? Can you like scan my dog? And, <laughs> and I was like, no, 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 and no. Um, and the reason that we couldn't do any of those things um, is the same reason that um, I went from no background knowledge to a working product in a year, a year and a half, um, and another more time to refine, is because the narrower the problem you can pick, the better off you are in being able to actually ship and use every constraint you have at your, at your um, disposal. Similar to what I said before, um, <coughs> go for simple. Anytime you have the choice, Use the oldest algorithms in the book that are like, you know, five lines of code. When you write a particularly like clever piece of code, 
throw it away and write it the dumb way. Um, <laughs> until you can really prove that it matters, until the profiling slows you, shows you that it's slowing you down, um, do the simple thing. Um, your future self will love you, other users will love you, um, and it means that you're gonna be able to get in there months later and hack in a fix the place where you need it and still understand what the hell you did all that time ago. Um, I sort of hit on this before, um, but I'm gonna, I'm, gonna, I'm gonna pound on it a little more and bear with me. If you go check out the Card.io Open Source Project, you will find that there is an entire copy of the Eigen Library um, copied and pasted into the tree. It's like hundreds of files. It is C++ templating shit that makes my brain hurt. Um, and it's all just like, I just took it and I put it in the tree. Why? A couple reasons. One, when somebody new goes to build Card.io, they don't have to be like, okay, what is this Eigen thing? Do I get it through Bundler? Do they even have Bundler for C++? Um, and you can, like go searching for Bundler for C++. Um, I don't have to explain to them how to download it, how to put it in the right location, how to build it, et cetera. Um, they get the project. They don't even know it uses Eigen. They hit build and it builds. That's really valuable. Also, um, people fix bugs in Eigen all the time. They're fixing bugs that are not my problem. I tested the part of Eigen that I use. It has, you know, it's a road warrior. It has been through millions of uses. It's solid. Somebody else's bug fix might break my shit. Why is it, why would I want to have somebody go and build it and be like, yeah, it doesn't work. And then I have to go chase down which version of Eigen and see if their stuff broke my stuff. Uh-uh. If you want reproducible builds, and in any professional environment you want reproducible builds, you have to own your own source code. So I update Eigen like every year or two and put it through its paces and then I'm like, great, you know, new version pasted into the tree, big commit, a diff I don't even read, I test it, we're off to the races. Again, everyone is afraid of vendoring. It is totally the right answer in some scenarios. Um, use your brain. This was a long and lonely project. Um, I sort of like holed up in, in, in New Haven with a GPU to keep my feet warm for like six months and didn't talk to anyone while I worked on it. <coughs> and this meant that like from one day to the next as my sanity slipped away, I would try myself trying the same things over and over again. Um, or I would be like, I had a really good idea yesterday and I have no idea what it was and maybe it was the beer I drank, but I'm pretty sure it was a good idea. <laughs> um, so I forced myself to write a little research journal, just 15 minutes at the end of the day, here's what I tried, Here's why I made the decisions I did. Here are the ideas that I had that I didn't have time to pursue. And I started doing this with all of my development and um, it's hugely valuable. It's um, software archeology span um, for your future self. It's a place to harvest ideas when you need them. Um, and if nothing else, it helps you practice your communication. So give it a try. Um, it sounds crazy. Um, the last thing, what I showed you, it's pretty simple. It took a long time to get level of simplicity. The total of Card.io was like 5,000 lines of code, which is not a lot to show for two years of hard work. Um, but it's the right code. It's the 5,000 lines of code that works, um, that's simple in the places that it can be and complicated in the places that it needs to be. Um, and I wrote a lot of other code. There's like 25,000 lines of research code that's still sitting there. And I'm sure at least two or three times that that I deleted the instant I wrote it because it just, it just failed off the bat and I just you know deleted it and moved on. And as you think about writing your code, you know, bear in mind, like, is this production code? Am I doing research? Um, this 25,000 lines of research code is terrible. The 50,000 lines I deleted is really bad. I mean, it's like riddled with bugs, you know, single letter, letter variable names, which are not as bad as you think. Um, and uh, so bear in mind, all of engineering is, um, is fundamentally a, a series of economic decisions. So make the economic decisions as you go. Um, amusingly, iOS takes more effort than, than um, Android does, despite Android being Java. That number still astonishes me. Okay, so um, if you thought this was really exciting, and at least like three of you will have, um, and you want to play with it more, um, the de facto project for playing with computer vision is OpenCV. Um, it's kind of a pain to install, but everyone uses it. Stack Overflow is full of snippets for you. Um, and you can get up and running really quickly. Like the, the demo that I showed you with all those effects and stuff, it's like 140 lines of code. Like it's nothing. Um, and there's a really amazing book called Learning OpenCV that is an introduction to computer vision as well as an introduction to, to OpenCV. Um, and it's basically how I learned computer vision. So definitely highly recommended. Um, on the machine learning front, 
there's an open source project called Theano. And it makes it easy to experiment with a, a broad class of machine learning models. Um, and it's accompanied by the deep learning tutorials, which are a really nice introduction to neural nets, convolutional neural nets, and deep learning in general. And deep learning is one of the, like, the big fancy hot topics in machine learning nowadays. Um, this is all the, you know, Google's hiring all the deep learning people that graduate from school. Um, so it's fun to play with. Um, the deep learning tutorials are very accessible. Um, so play with Theano. Eigen is only if um, you're really into like C++ templates and you want to see what really, really fast matrix multiplication looks like. Um, otherwise, it's good to use and not to look at. Um, certainly look through the Card.io um, code if you're so inspired. And uh, if you're into just general image processing, like you want to make Instagram, um, which you know some of you will be like, yeah, that, that's cool and stuff, but I really just want to make Instagram. Um, Brad Larson has a really nice iOS project that helps you see how to do some neat things with GPU and image processing. Um, and of course, um, you could also come like do an internship or work at Braintree. You probably won't do any computer vision, but um, they pay my bills and I can test that uh, they're full of um, nice, wonderful people to work with. So I will uh, leave this slide up and hopefully we have time for questions. And I should say, um, I brought um, things to bribe you with, to ask questions. So if you ask a question, I have small, medium, and large t-shirts. Tell me your, your t-shirt size. And, uh, <laughs> so come up with a question so you get a free t-shirt. You can ask me anything. Do we have a, we have a roving microphone for questions? Um, I have a question, if there is uh, any kind of uh, pre-processing of sampling images before the, the processing is done, for example, uh, averaging of, uh, of pixels to remove noise or anything like that? Yeah, um, so it's a good question. We experimented with a bunch of things like that, um, and the answer is no, we don't do any pre-processing. And the reason is, um, Think about it from an information theoretic perspective. Almost any pre-processing you do is going to destroy some information. And it turns out, by the time you get down to those little eights that I showed you, that's 19 pixels by 27 pixels. And you think about an, um, an eight in these like 19 pixel thing, you have to go from dark <coughs> to light, to dark, to light, to dark again. So you have to make five transitions in 19 pixels um, that doesn't leave a lot of room for error. So if you lose even the tiniest bit of information, it degrades your ability later on in the, um, the processing to be able to do anything useful. Um, what's your t-shirt size? <laughs> Maybe, uh, I think a large. Okay, you, you can lie and say you're small if you want. <laughs> <laughs> All right, next question. Thanks. Hi again. Um, I see you've dedicated a lot, a lot of your time to this project, um, but uh, earlier this week you gave a workshop on Go. So, what are you doing right now? <laughs> 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 like, what's your problem? Like, what <laughs> no, you no, better to do more like <laughs> uh, your vision. This, um, this seems finished. Yeah. Uh, so, so. Um, I did follow some of Scott's advice, um, and I found a good owner for Card.io once I was done with it. Um, so one of my colleagues at PayPal um, now maintains it. He's building expiry support and doing some really fun things with it. Um, I was sort of done building Card.io after two odd years. Um, I got to the point where it was stable, it was reliable, we'd sold the company, we'd gone through all the transitions. Um, and so when I first got to PayPal, I worked on building some mobile SDKs, and then I worked on some um, Bluetooth low energy hardware called the PayPal Beacon. And while I was doing that, I was writing the firmware in Go, and I, I became obsessed with Go. Um, it's awesome. And I became so obsessed with it that I really, really wanted to know how it worked. This is taking um, investing your tools to an extreme. And I decided that it wasn't enough to have like read the standard library. Um, I needed to know how the compiler worked. So I started working on the compiler. And <laughs> no one really seemed to notice or care, um, which is a depressing thought that people at my work were like, oh, I don't know what Josh is doing this week. I'm sure it's fine. <laughs> <laughs> but um, 
it ended up being useful to have inside the company someone with some expertise about the tools. So now I spend like 90% of my time um, working on the Go compiler and tools and the like. Um, so, you know, phases, stages, always something new. Um, T-shirt size? <laughs> Small, I guess. Uh, <laughs> right, large it is. <laughs> <laughs> we better not get any questions from the back because uh, <laughs> I need a cannon. Uh, hi, uh, how are you dealing with the competition uh, rising like NFC and some other stuff? Yeah, um, good question. So uh, there's all sorts of stuff happening in the payment space. There's cryptocurrency, there's NFC, um, there's BLE used for, um, for payments. Um, there's um, PayPal, which circumvents the need for a credit card. Um, credit cards are pretty well established. Um, they have a, a pretty um, good niche in the market and they might die, but it's really hard to change a payment system. And the reason is that you have a two-sided market. Um, you have merchants and you have users, and to move how they interact, you have to get both of them to move at the same time. And so, um, and it's very hard with payment systems to get a unilateral incentive. So why would merchants install a bunch of NFC um, uh, readers if no one has NFC? Similarly, why would users have a bunch of NFC if no merchants accept it? So we're starting to see exciting stuff with, um, for example, um, Apple and Apple Pay, where Apple says, you want to buy an iPhone anyway, and by the way, bonus, you're getting NFC. Um, this sort of big unilateral movement will probably cause big shifts um, in the payment industry, but these shifts happen really slowly. Like physical terminals, you know, 15 million of them scattered across the US. Um, credit cards are sort of a, the lingua franca. I wish it was cash, but really they are the lingua franca. Um, and I would be delighted to see credit cards die. They're, they're really, from, from, from pretty much any perspective, they're a disaster. But they're not going to die soon, so, you know, may as well support them and, and make people type less. Uh, T-shirt size? Large. <coughs> Excellent. Um, pass it back, eh? <laughs> Are you currently um, thinking in involving in the project uh, without credit cards or something like that? So um, card IO is about credit cards. Um, when credit cards die, so will card IO. Um, <laughs> and that's fine. Um, like most software has a fairly um, short usable lifespan. Um, in fact, card IO will probably die well before credit cards. Um, I am fascinated by other um, forms of payments, but it won't be a computer vision um, problem to solve. Um, it will be something else. It will be Internet of Things problems. It will be some cryptocurrency. Um, I don't know what it is. Um, it's going to be fun to watch, but uh, somehow I'm not really worried about it. If you get too wound up in your ego and your code and, and you're like, when they were acquiring the company, they were like, you know, um, it's okay. You can keep your logo. And I was like, eh, you know, like it's some brackets. Like it's not a big deal. Um, but people get like, the founders get, they, they tie their entire ego into this company um, and coders tie their entire ego into the code. You go to do a code review and they're like, every character is perfect. I won't touch it. Like, don't be that, that guy or gal. Um, like, <laughs> you know, easy come, easy go. So, card I will go. It'll be fine. Okay. T-shirt size? Uh, medium. <laughs> Our first you. medium. Excellent. Um, I'm sorry to be reiterating on the same question, but... Um, you seem to have a really modular project and you seem to have a large domain over the, well, the, the processing the, of the images and, uh, and of the credit cards. Uh, my question is, why not pick that up and try to do something like, well, as you're talking, uh, passport uh, processing or, yeah. or, or other? It's a, it's a fair question. Why I don't personally is because I'm now bored with it. Um, <laughs> That's uh, just the honest truth. Um, but I would be delighted for other folks too. I mean, so um, we, we met the, uh, the Card Munch team who, um, they had a sort of a, a, a business card scanning app and uh, they were acquired by LinkedIn and um, they used a trick that I really wish we could have used. They just found the card and they sent it to Mechanical Turk and had people transcribe it. And I was like, I could totally not do that. <laughs> um, but 
when we met them, they were like, your card detection is so much better than ours. Um, can, you know, can we have it? And at the time I had to say no, and now fortunately I can say yes. So what I, I hope is that some of the pieces that are modular, that are reusable, um, will get picked up by people who are excited. And they're like, I got some project where I totally need to detect rectangles. Like, great, steal my code, copy and paste it, don't contribute back, it's cool, I'm glad it's getting used. Um, but I'm not gonna go chase after passports because um, I sadly don't use mine that much. Um, <laughs> T-shirt size? Uh, M. M. Thank you. I think we have one of those. Thanks. <coughs> I get enough T-shirts here to keep Drow in exercise running up and down for hours. <laughs> <laughs> I hope you haven't answered this before, but I got here a little late. Uh, how did you enter the world of computer vision? Did you start with OpenCV? Did you test anything else? How did it go? Um, so, started with OpenCV, um, never left it, hacked on it. Um, there's all sorts of stuff out there. Um, I wanted something that was gonna be simple, reliable, um, road tested, and um, I also didn't really know what I was doing. And so, <laughs> like, if you don't know what you're doing, starting with a market leader, Pretty good place to start. Um, and then we never really had a, had a need to leave. Um, T-shirt size? Large. Okay. <laughs> I should have brought like a song and dance stuff so I can all be. Here, I'll, I'll I'll tell you a really stupid story while we find the next question. Um, so I was emailing back and forth with um, Joao, and I was like, what's that name? How do you pronounce it? So I went on YouTube and I looked up like how to pronounce Joao, and uh, <laughs> there was like some dude put up a, a, a video of how to pronounce Joao, and then someone else was like, that's totally wrong, and they put up their own video, <laughs> and someone else was like, no, no, that's not how you do it. And I watched all these videos and they sounded exactly the same. <laughs> and I was like, I'm totally hosed. <laughs> so no, and then he told me I could call him John, and so now I'm really practicing Joao. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Okay, so one question more about PayPal. Yeah. Uh, now with, with Apple Pay and more the, the payment through the mobile phones, uh, do you think, or it's the position, PayPal is going to, to work with Apple or develop some, some payments to, to, you know, like you go to McDonald's and instead yeah. of paying with your credit card, you pay with your PayPal account or something like that. So I'm gonna answer a slightly different question, but one that's close. I'm gonna answer the same question, but with Braintree replaced. And the answer is yes. Um, so um, part of Braintree's um, mantra, their raison d'etre, is um, to let you integrate once and support all kinds of payment options. You can meet your users wherever they are, and talk to Braintree, it'll just work. And um, Braintree already has integration with Apple Pay um, and other providers, um, and they just wanna help. So Braintree's original uh, founding story was to make payments sucks. Don't, <laughs> um, they wanna make payments suck less. And um, part of that is helping developers <coughs> meet their users wherever they are. Um, shirt size? Medium. Medium. All right. One last question. Excellent. For, the, for the, this hard work, how many people were needed? Um, so the question, since it was sort of soft, was um, how many people were involved in Card.io? Um, yes. When, uh, when I started, it was myself and my co-founder. He was non-technical, um, so it was great. He took care of talking to all the idiot VCs and I just wrote code. Um, <laughs> uh, if our VCs are listening, you're not idiots, it was all the rest of them. <laughs> <laughs> um, that's why we picked you. Um, it was just me writing code for the first year. Um, we hired uh, a totally brilliant engineer who um, fixed all of my um, UX disasters. He looks, he's like, you're using programmer red, that's like one zero zero. Uh, um, and he worked with, um, with me for another six months. We hired somebody, by the time the, the um, team was acquired, we were, um, six, four of which were programmers, um, but being realistic, um, the vast majority of what I showed you, I built alone myself, slowly and painstakingly. Uh, mm -hmm. T-shirt size? Large. Large, excellent. 
Um, I have more t-shirts, so if you want to come mob the stage, um, I will not give you any t-shirts. <laughs> no, no, please, come talk to me afterwards, I'll give you t-shirts. Thank you, everybody. So I have a question, Josh. Uh, T-shirt size? <laughs> medium. Medium. Ah, oh, damn, this is a large. <laughs> Someone grab a medium, please. All right. Thank you, everybody. This was Josh Schneider introducing Cardio. First time since it was open source. First talk about it. So. Yes, really, you're the guinea pigs. Yeah, we're really glad about it. Uh, so, next we've got Peterson from. Well, everybody knows. <laughs> Sorry about that. Uh, do, all right. Probably not everybody will be able to watch it here. So we'll have streaming rooms uh, here and zero. Minus two, all right, minus two. And uh, zero. All right, we'll have streaming rooms if you don't enter. Probably there will be someone telling you where to go. So thank you very much. Hope you enjoyed it. Thank you.